Forum. Sir, for man, kasi kunti lang kami ngayon kasi nagkaroon ng sabay-sabay ng mga media events in this city. So, meron sa Centrio, meron din sa Sapon. Meron pang taga Piragwirada News, St. Sologa, where are you? Um, of course, we have a good friend here from in town, Director Emil Wansa, yeah, and Ria of oh, USDP. <laughs> Our panelists this afternoon on the Port Mindanao Policy Research Forum this conference are uh, we have here Dr. Ambrosio Coltora II, Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation, University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, sir. And uh, Dr. Rizaldi Tan, Director of PPVDO, Mindanao Development Authority. Dr. Rosalito Carino, our OIC President of USDP. Dr. Celia Reyes, President, Philippine Institute for Development Studies, PIDS. And uh, Ramon Razal, President, DOST in RCT, National Research Council of the Philippines. And also, we have here, kung meron kayong mga questions sa pilo uh, media po kayo de oro, we have here Ms. Ria Persa, founder and CEO, staff with her, over there. Ms. Ria. And Dr. Glynis Balaguas, founder and director of Environmental and Climate Change Research Institute, De La Salle University. Welcome, sir. Well, without much ado, we would like to request our panelists to have a opening statement before the Q&A portion. Uh, let's start off with uh, from PIDC. Uh, PIDC. Yeah, PIDC. Ma'am, please. Feel its accountability and responsibility 
as a government institution to travel development. And that we want that the university will be a different university that is really blazing new ways. And that we are launching the uh, education revolution with innovation. And that uh, we join the disruptive environment. And that, that will be lateral because the second semester we will introduce a new modality in de delivering in, uh, education involving heavily the community and the city and the university. And that is hope that everybody will be involved and that the university will no longer exist in isolation with the community and with industry. Rather, are working it out to operationalize the triple helix between the government, the university, and the community, and the industry works together. And uh, the person of uh, business and improvement of quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We would like to hear also from uh, Dr. Ramon Razal, President uh, in RCP. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I represent the National Research Council of the Philippines, which is under the Department of Science and Technology and this is a group of uh, scientists in the country. There are about 4,000 members of this organization. And we come here as a new partner, a new partner for Minda, and bringing with us the expertise of our uh, scientists so that we can contribute to the development of uh, Mindanao. I come here with the support of the governing board. There are 15 of them. And when they learned that I was going to enter into a memorandum of uh, cooperation with the uh, BIDA, uh, I have the 100% support of the uh, governing board for me to, for NRCP, to provide uh, support uh, to BIDA as it uh, works towards the development of Mindanao as a region so that it doesn't lag behind the rest of the country in terms of development in terms of industrialization and in terms of the quality of life of the people in the, in the, uh, in the, in the region. Thank you, Dr. Razal. We would like to also hear from uh, Dr. Ambrosio Potoran II of USDP. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Minda and uh, PIDs for uh, giving us USDP an opportunity to partner with this uh, uh, forum, research forum. Uh, the university has already, uh, five years ago, we started uh, this uh, innovation, introducing innovation. In fact, uh, inno innovation is part of the training system of our students, innovative projects. Uh, luckily, we introduced this industry 4.0. We believe that industry 4.0 the all aspect, all fields, the industry point zero can be applied. Uh, even in personal, from policy, uh, any, anything. Uh, that's why the university in 2015 introduced this technopreneurs, technopreneurship. We want to produce technopreneurs because we believe that technopreneurs, innovators, is the driver of this industry point zero. Without them, I think we cannot be successful in utilizing, in implementing this industry 4.0. As mentioned by the speaker this morning, the driver will be the innovators, which is the technopreneurs. And there is a need for the university to establish this innovation ecosystem so that the industry 4.0 will be uh, implemented and realized in, in, in our country. And I think industry 4.0 also can help come up with this good policy. The industry 4.0 can help all policy makers. 
if we use this industry 4.0, uh, because we know industry 4.0 is with big data, about, about smart technology, it's about the internet of things. If we provide our policy makers with this data, with this big data, let's say for example, in mining industry, if they don't have this data, uh, uh, data to analyze what happened now in the ground. For example, in the university now, we have this research on mining. Uh, if we will not give this input, this data, to the policy makers, then this research output will be useless. Will be file will be remain in the as an output. But if we input this one to the policy makers, then they will say, yeah, there is a need to come up with a policy. Because as uh, initial initial result or initial findings of this mining, our our water is already contaminated with this uh, with this material. Uh, so th uh, that's why I think it's very important that uh, we need to uh, collaborate and work. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, uh, we would like to call on Dr. Rizaldi Tan, uh, Director of Viva. Thank you. On behalf of Sec Alonto, good afternoon and sorry, happy good afternoon. I'm not getting the response that uh, the university. Okay, uh, I'm representing Sec Alonto on behalf of Linda. And let me just share a quick background. Bakit meron tayong four policy and research forum. The Linda, as mandated by law, the public has 996 coordinating harmonizes and integrates any policy plan and programs in the law. So anything that is interregional in Mindanawai, or even really specific but maybe or maybe Mindanawai and Terribunal Impact, MINDA can contribute on, on, on these aspects. But we're very fortunate that we're in partnership with the PIDS, uh, the Delta of Assembly is here, and this afternoon we're cementing our collaboration with the National Research Council of the Philippines. And as a background, this is already our fourth forum. The first we had four years ago was done in, in Davao. And the theme was on the Mindanao Development Contour. The second was done in Butuan. And the theme then was about water and land. It was really about environment. And the third was on governance, specifically on federalism. So from water in two years ago, today it's going to be fire, but not literally <laughs> so low. It's really the fourth industrial revolution. And we're very fortunate that si Dr. Uh, Kerino volunteered to become the host university for the fourth policy and the research forum. And uh, we are looking forward to do the same next year together with the IDS, with the non center members, and the NRC. Uh, to another region, because in the economy, you know, uh, and katulad na sinabi ng Dr. Uh, Ambrosio, we are shepherding basic and applied researchers and policy directed researchers so that our policy and decision makers are better informed when they craft or pass laws. So with that, again, thank you and happy good afternoon to all of us. And thank you to our media partners for creating this event uh, with, with us. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, while siguro our panelists are taking their lunch, can we continue to go on with our presentation? sir? Huh? Okay. So, with our panelists this afternoon, we have also here uh, top-notch uh, uh, mga educators, no? mga scientists. From all over the country, we have Dr. Ramon, Ramonet Serafika. Senior Research Fellow, PIDES. Where are you, ma'am? Dr. Dr. Elmer Dadius of the Rasami University. Dr. Roni Rolano Brayunis, Senior Research Fellow, PIDES. Dr. Alexander Campanella of ISPAMA. Dr. Marietta Sumaga Isai, Director of National Research Council of the Philippines. And we have also Ms. Miriam Mias, 
of uh, USDP, uh, Dr. Geraldo Pitelia, and the National Research Council of the Philippines. And uh, Dr. Emanuel Leanio, Mindanao Cluster Head, National Research Council of the Philippines. Uliludin tayo ng mga doctors ngayon this afternoon and then uh, I think uh, the media kagayang de oro is a uh, challenge to question you all of you here this afternoon on research and uh, science related uh, uh, events. It's uh, the PDI, the Philippine National uh, Philippine Institute of Development Studies in collaboration with MINDA and uh, USDP. Uh, later in the afternoon, we will have a ceremonial signing and closing uh, ceremonial signing on the memorandum of collaboration between in RCP and MINDA. Uh, I think somebody from the panel will explain what is the signing this afternoon. And uh, now we would like to hear from the uh, our media colleagues that you are in a portion now. Uh, please uh, identify yourself and uh, represent which uh, organization you represent this afternoon. So please. Any question first from uh, Ms. Tis Baloyos from DXKO. Uh, By the way, Ms. Baloyos is a former DOST Science Information Officer. He's now retired, but not lying. Okay, Ms. Tis, your first question.
the education, uh, the the uh, humidity and the, the even the fertilizer, we can control that. So this is available now. It is in Morong. We're doing this. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a as I mentioned, this, Rizal, Rizal. Uh, uh, this is in my bankal Morong Rizal. Uh, my researchers. Uh, this is a joint project. Also, we have researchers from University of Rizal. Yes, uh, this is pilot, but this is available uh, already. The the, the 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 people in uh, uh, the north, uh, they are doing this already. Vertical farming. So the idea is uh, we can have a layer of plants uh, in a uh, container, uh, particularly even uh, the 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 truck van, uh, the 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 container van that can be utilized as the chamber. Uh, that's what uh, the, the group from Arizona were doing. Uh, they put a uh, 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 conditioning system there they, because they control the temperature. They can control uh, the, the lights because important for the plants uh, to have a, a, a light. That's why uh, they can produce it in full year round production. So in my in our in my uh, studies, uh, we're doing for lettuce and tomatoes, so it's ongoing. And aside from that, we have also I have a company by the way, Neuronmec, and we're doing uh, projects with Filmmec. Uh, so we can uh, uh, now is book book is very very uh, famous. We had a, a system now that can distinguish or that can detect this weevil, rice weevil. Uh, and uh, it's uh, already for commercialization. This is we, we were commissioned by the Filmec. And also in terms of the selection of the quality of the products, I uh, like our export, the, the, the mangoes. We use vision system uh, to uh, classify mangoes. Uh, uh, what part has a, a what mango is reject, what mango is for export. So we have that one. Uh, I'm going to present that one this afternoon also. Uh, we have also uh, even the the quality of the fish, the tuna. Uh, we can we can uh, measure, we can classify even the size, the weight. We can do that. So as far as uh, uh, this uh, uh, smart farming is concerned, we are on top of that also. Ah, if I may add. The University of Science and Technology of, the, of Southern Philippines, Claveria Campus, is focusing on few. This few is food, environment, and water. Because we believe and we few, we focus on few, food, environment, and water. So, um, why water? Because we believe that 20 years from now, this, the Third World War will, will not be fought because of oil, but with water. And that uh, we partner with the University of the Philippines with a project, Sarai, and other 11 state universities and colleges throughout the country. And uh, for Region 10, we have Central Mindanao University and USD Victoria area. And uh, USM in Cotabato, I think you said in, uh, uh, in Davao, and the rest are in Luzon and uh, Visayas. So this uh, Salai is funded by the USD and this is smarter approaches in revitalizing agriculture industry. This is the phase two now and we have just uh, launched the inception meeting yesterday at USD Viglaberia whereby um, Scientists from the University of the Philippines had presented the outputs of the Sarai Peace One. So yesterday was the launching and subscription meeting of the Sarai Peace Two. Sarai Peace One had engaged 33 partners, SUKs and uh, government agencies, but they trimmed down to 11 SUKs this time and we have the output already that farmers will be advised for the effect of a seven day weather 
uh, occurrences. So they can forecast if this seven day forecast through the data that is gathered in this station. Farmers now can access the uh, website or there is a developed application simulating the interaction of these agroclimatic conditions so that they will be guided whether they will uh, turn on the irrigation system or uh, how do I say manipulate manipulate the temperature no? if that is in the greenhouses. The other thing is we engage the drones to uh, to conduct surveillance of what is happening in the occurrences of pests. Also there is an application developed no? that the farmers can send the picture of the insects or pest in the field and that the application can identify the disease or the pest and they will be guided and they will be advised on what to do. So uh, the University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines Claveria Campus has focused on two commodities, coffee and cacao. So these two commodities uh, we want to uh, spear here in developing research for farmers, not only in the production, but also in the business. So they are uh, engaged, no? the, the cacao and coffee farmers will be engaged in the research on site in the respective farms. So uh, data that is to be gathered and application later on as to the inter uh, interaction of uh, weather, water, and uh, pest, and including people, will be put into one plate, and that our farmers will be empowered. And they will no longer be farmers only, but also agribusiness farmers. So it is our hope with our project in uh, USDP Claveria, the 40 million irrigation project that is to showcase the Israel technologies of drip and overhead irrigation so that we will address the region's uh, food security and environmental sustainability initiatives so that people in the region, if not all of Mindanao, would learn lessons of these initiatives. So we are going to establish modern and smart agriculture in the Claveria campus. That is also in collaboration with the information and data science programs of the Cagayan Bureau campus. So our researchers, our scientists here in Cagayan Bureau with their expertise in uh, data science and information technology will be applied in the field of agriculture. So we would like again to emphasize that the University of Science and Technology would want to land in the ground, touching the lives of people in the community, and touching the lives of people in the industry. So that the University of Science and Technology will have its connect between industry and the community so that at the end of the day, we answer accountability and responsibility on public funds. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Additional, sir? May I just kindly compliment Dr. Kirin Oshir. Not only in this part, we do also have a program in collaboration with the Environment and Climate Change Research Institute, headed by Dr. Ben was under an annual program we call Climate Smart, sorry, Climate Smart Mindanao, and as a component on view, food, energy, and water nexus. We capacitate LGUs to do uh, rainfall and temperature scenario and forecast as reference in their planning for agriculture development. And may, with the intelligence of our partner, Dr. Glenn, may I kindly request you to please also briefly share 
where are we now in terms of our climate smart Mindanao and the fuel program? Thank you very much. I'm talking for somewhere. Um, your answer? It doesn't work. Sorry. So, hi. Well, that's, I think that's part of my presentation later. <laughs> All right. So the fuel for you system, the food, energy, water nexus system, is actually funded with the shared deal SD. All right. And uh, yes, it's uh, it's not just a database. It's a comprehensive system that contains and composed of all the resources, food resources, energy resources, water resources, all over the Philippines. Now, for Mindanao, we part uh, the food, energy, water nexus system is just part of of what we call the climate smart. So if we talk about climate smart, uh, it's not just about resiliency, but we're also talking about mitigation, and that's how we're going to reduce our greenhouse gases and our carbon dioxide equivalents. So the reason why that's why it's called climate smart. So you are focusing on both adaptation and mitigation. So mitigation is the uh, the, the reduction of GHGs, and for the adaptation, it's we are more on identifying the risk. Um, Identify, assessing the risk, and then uh, managing the risk. And the, la and the last part is how you are going to to communicate this particular risk. Now, if we talk about the food and water nexus system, like uh, it's also similar to what other people are doing, other research scientists are doing, simply be um, because uh, it's not just about a database of all these resources. There is a multi-scenario-based analysis. What if, for instance? There's a 300 kilometer per hour super typhoon. How is it going to affect your 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 food and your water resources? All right. What if you have a nine meter storm surge? How is it going to affect food and your water resources or nexus system in a certain province? And that particular nexus system is for free. All right. Uh, we don't sell it. It's for free. All right. And 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 um, for Mindanao, it's going to be housed in Mindanao, Mindanao Development Authority, and the different provinces, of course, here in this region. So I think that's it. So any other questions? <laughs> yeah. By the way, Life is Smart, we have, um, anyway, some of the we could now, all right? I'm gonna uh, tell it for everyone. Right. So aside from that, we have the, aside from the Life is Smart, we have this particular program, Life is Smart and Disaster Resilient Philippines. So we, we have just started that with that. Um, Life is Smart and Disaster Resilient Philippines, so we're using this particular framework, the TRIP framework. TRIP, TRIP stands for Track uh, Risk Impact Policy. Why track? Because we want to integrate historical analysis, what really happened to a certain area, all right? And what is going to happen? What's going to happen for the next 30 years? What's going to happen in 60 years, all right? What are the climate parameters? What are the projections, all right, in terms of rainfall and temperature? Now for the risk, we're using the uh, we're using the frame of the UN IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. Whenever you assess the risk, it's a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Now, it, uh, now we're mainstreaming it to different localities with the use of CEDRA or the CDRBA. For the impact assessment, we're using the HLURB framework, or the impact chain analysis, wherein the, there's an assessment in terms of biophysical, social economics, and that also includes the biodiversity, and for the policy, uh, the projects have to be adaptation or mitigation, and then we provide uh, science-based policies based on different assessments. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And talking of climate and typhoon, before I call on John Morocco to be able to the next question, I would like to throw this question to Ms. Ria Persa. What is this technology application for weather forecasting? Because Pagasa has announced yesterday or the other day that a strong typhoon is coming over in Luzon, for some parts of Sarisa, Mindanao. No? Yes, hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share about my work. I'll just introduce briefly that my organizations are such that I am partnered with NOAA in the United States, which is our weather and climate governmental organization in the United States. And also we are partnered with ECCRI, the Environmental Research for Climate Change, the Environmental Climate Change Research Institute, which 
Glenn is presiding over, and so I'm so thankful to be here and to share about my work. I'm also the CEO of Stat Weather, based in the U.S., and also the founder of Stat Weather Institute, a humanitarian organization based here in the Philippines, and also my work has been with NASA in the United States. And so my expertise is in the area of climate and weather modeling, in the area of prediction and risk. And so what we have developed through my organization is currently, and it was awarded just in the last year, the number one climate technology in the world by Environment Business International. We are, the, we are we have been rated internationally as the best climate technology for the prediction of long range extreme weather and climate systems. Because when we have more accurate prediction of what is going to happen, then we can more accurately determine our risks and our impacts and have a longer lead time for preparation against those risks. And so that is really the expertise is in prediction. And then I have some other initiatives that we are doing, which is in the category, and this will be expounded upon further in my presentation later on, but there are ways in which typhoons themselves can be mitigated. And so I'm going to explain some of the experimental procedures that we're doing on a very large scale. You say, how can a, ty how can a typhoon be mitigated? And I will show you the things that we have done at the University of Miami and what the field work that we have done in the waters that actually keep storm surges at bay and keep our people safer. And we will also be doing this here in Mindanao for upcoming extreme weather conditions as part of a humanitarian effort. And so those are some of the projects in which I am involved. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your initial information, Mark. There may be some more later from your end. We will call on now with John Robert from PAA. Um, I would just like to ask about um, uh, this fourth industrial revolution. What is this about? Are there any mentioned earlier that uh, we have to prepare for a disruptive era of disruptive technology? Can you expand? Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we've seen some examples uh, this morning, although um, unfortunately um, our video uh, didn't work. But like one common example would be driverless cars. So that's just an example of what kind of the kinds of technology that we're talking about. And somebody has shared about, for instance, getting pictures of plants and then the, the system being able to diagnose whether that plant has disease or not. And so some de decision support systems. So marami, marami classing applications. But I think um, what we also need to highlight is that once there are innovations out there, there are technologies out there um, that are being developed and they are disruptive because they're going to change the way we do things. Um, so that's why we call them disruptive. And, and I think we need to focus attention on, there are innovations out there, um, many of them not yet widely adopted. Um, we've, we've been hearing some examples of the work, the research that, that's going on, but I think we need to focus on Okay, what happens when these technologies become widely adopted? And I think that's one area where we haven't really focused on. We've been focusing on the technology development side, but we at the ideas think that we need to prepare better for that. So for instance, if you have 100 workers, agricultural workers um, doing what they usually do, and then you adopt this technology where Elmer would just switch on, um, switch on something in, you know, water, get, uh, water uh, irrigation starts, you have the right temperature, fertilizer is being added to, to the soil, and you only need probably, what, Elmer 1? 
two, three persons to, to do it. So you you pro you are actually display you can potentially display some jobs. And I think that's what we want to highlight that um, there are definitely opportunities. Um, productivity would go up, incomes would go up to those who would be able to take advantage of these technologies. But just like in, in the other earlier revolutions, I, I think we need to take note of possible challenges that turn to occur for this. And, and that's what we would like to highlight, that we can, um, we need not be afraid if we're better prepared because we can actually do something in terms of managing this, this risk. So one is, um, for instance, uh, better preparing our workforce. So um, as they say before, I, I think our group, anong tawag kanina, baby boomers, ngayon, we're used to just having one job. Um, we retire in the first job that, that we entered, but now the millennials, they, they just change jobs. So the kind of education that we need to provide to our workforce now is going to be a little different. And Monet has actually highlighted its lifelong desire to learn. So you need to um, instill that, that um, appetite for learning because what will happen is you will have to upskip to, to always upgrade your skills to be able to cope with all of these uh, changes in, in technology. So I think what we really want to, to um, put across is that, yes, there are technologies out there, and it's very exciting because there are opportunities really for um, uh, taking advantage of the gains from these technologies, but we also need to be better prepared for this. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Any follow-up, Jam? Um, do you think uh, we are ready for for this um, changes in our technologies? Um, maybe the millennials are, but um, like for example in agriculture, um, one of the things why one of the reasons why there is a high price is because of the low productivity. So how how will that help, um, or how will that um, uh, support the agriculture sector at the same time? Because our farmers are the, the uh, median age is like. You mentioned, I think the average age is about 54 or 57 years old uh, for, for the farmer. So um, I, I think it would be a little, uh, or what would be the appropriate term, challenging to um, switch them to smart farming, but it's not impossible. Um, but I think those are the challenges that, that we need to, to deal with. It's not going to be very easy. I, I think the plus, I don't know whether you would want to call it plus factor, is that. Um, I, we don't think that adoption is going to happen immediately for all sectors. So there's time to transition in, into that. But nevertheless, I, I think we need to um, to make sure that we are taking steps towards that. And in fact, that's why we're very happy to be hearing about the, the so many programs here in, in Mindanao, in particular at USPT, in terms of uh, how these new technologies can, can, can be um, uh, can be used to, to, to improve. But I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, a one colleague from PEI mentioned that overall, um, agriculture is still in um, Industry 2.0. Uh, if we're talking about Industry 4.0, uh, if you look at agriculture, and I think you, you probably have a better sense of that, if you go around the farms, uh, from especially the, the small farms, Perhaps Dr. Kirino might, might be able to share something, but um, I don't think they're using the the farm that uh, Elmer described earlier, where you have this uh, uh, container vans, highly controlled temperature, irrigation, uh, input, and so forth. But what you would find would be farms who are still worrying about water, uh, worrying about the uh, Farmers who haven't tested their soil, haven't done soil analysis, so I, I think it's still a little different from the ideal farm, kind of farm that, that uh, we would want. To. Yeah. Um, the University of Science and Technology would like to be different. We would like to respond appropriately in this uh, crisis or, shall we say, phenomenon. Uh, inflation, as you mentioned, 
how do we respond to this and are we reading? Well, it's a mindset. Being reading when and who. We have classified the population to be millennials, uh, baby boomers, and uh, centennials. And we have this fact that 57 years old is the average of the farmers. That is why we would like to change the mindset of our students. Starting first semester, second semester rather, they will no longer stay in school for the rest of the week. Rather, it's only for uh, three days, the first three days, or only three days, they will be in school for lectures. And the other three days, they will be in the community, they will be in the industry to learn how to learn. It is how to respond. Because this uh, getting older farmers, we will not call them old farmers, but getting old uh, farmers are no longer receptive to the technologies. And that they themselves, ironically, are not encouraging their sons and daughters to enroll in agriculture courses. Because we have that old concept of so we have to change this outlook and that's why the University of Science and Technology is changing including the mindset of people. That is why in this university when you ask, kumusta? We don't say, okay lang. We don't say, more ngayon, but we say, asin so dako. So that when people hear this frequently, it will be instilled in their minds na kailangan mag-respond. Having that positive attitude, having that optimistic behavior, na mayroon pang pag-asa. Hindi natin, uh, we will not lodge our hope to sweat dress, to luto, but to change our environment. It is one of the roles of the university, not only to change technology, but also to change the minds of the people, the young especially so that there is that there is that uh, uh, trade-off of technology this time so you can learn things uh, very easy but you forget about values it is useless to be a cum laude if you don't have a social you know uh, virtue it is needed in our community and that's we are losing these virtues these values so we want that our students will be immersed in the industry we want that our professors will be together in this immersion program so that they can discuss among themselves while they are in the industry while they are in the community what are the problems present and that in their research they can look for a possible solution so that there is an upliftment of the quality of life of the people in the community. That, and that's the ultimate goal of university. And that most, if not all, of these universities haven't yet changed their mind. <coughs> what is in their mind is to teach students but actually, this time, in the fourth industrial revolution, if professors use the methodologies in the second or first to third industrial revolution, they become redundant. Because their students know more than what they know. Because these professors use the old notes of their professors when they study the university. Well, the young ones just one click, then with the access in the internet, we can learn many things. So what's the use of having professors? This is to guide them with the right values. So the paradigm now is not the transfer of knowledge, but to develop in the students the ability to learn how to learn. And the only way to, to, to learn how to learn is to experience themselves in the field. So that whatever situation that they may have 
in the future they are able to respond appropriately. Because this is all about survival. This is all, this, all, this is all about improving the quality of lives. And to respond and to survive. Doesn't need the brightest, doesn't need the smartest, but those who respond appropriately will survive. So it is where the university is trying to complement industry 4.0 or 4.0 with education 4.0. Innovation, revolution in education must also undergo, must also happen. Because we don't want, again, that what the industry needs is not being supplied by the university. Students know the problem and operations of the industry. It is where we will real realize productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness. And that the University of Southern, uh, Science and Technology of Southern Philippines would like to trailblaze in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Can I also respond? Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, uh, all of us have the view is that uh, Industry 4.0 will really uh, uh, replace uh, the works of the people. Now, uh, whether we like it or not, it will come. It will really come. So uh, we have no choice. So we have to prepare ourselves for that. Uh, uh, as I mentioned this morning, industry for uh, industry uh, 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 first generation of industry industrial revolution happens in 17th century, and there's really a real revolution by the people because they are afraid that their works will be uh, taken over. Also, this is the period that we are also experiencing now. Uh, when in fact, long ago it was proven that it really works for the benefit of humanity. So how would we address this? What is important is uh, we will train our people, okay, to cope up, to, to be knowledgeable on that. And the strategy should be done. Uh, remember Industry 4.0 is the integration of digital technologies and uh, physical and biological things. It's not only on mechanical engineering, it's not only on electrical engineering, it's not only on cyber engineering, it involves the whole, so it's now interdisciplinary research. So that's our trust, particularly as a researchers. I'm talking of LaSalle and I'm talking of NRCP, I'm talking of researchers in the OST. We, we really uh, uh, advocate the interdisciplinary kind of research. So it, it, it is really interesting because our students, uh, we have manufacturing, we have electrical, we have mechanical, we have computer science, really love to go to the farm. They are not based on agriculture, engineering, or whatever. And they have to learn what is in the farm. They have to learn how to grow plants. So you can imagine this this uh, very uh, very uh, sophisticated guy from the sun going to the farms and uh, uh, enjoying. The, 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 the key word there is enjoying their works. Okay? So imagine the control, they even built a uh, piece farm uh, because in our system, in the smart uh, farm, the fertilizer, or rather the irrigation will come from the piece farm because uh, we are sure that the nutrients from there is uh, sufficient already. But we have to measure that. We have a sensor to, to look at the uh, nitrogen, potassium, the, the NPK of that uh, water because we can do hyd hydroponics or... Uh, so. The, the, the students love to do that. Uh, it is fully controlled. They have their uh, uh, program on uh, automated system wherein if the sensor says that it lacks of the, the, the water, automatically the valve will open. Nobody should open that manually. It's their program. Uh, when, when it says that the temperature is not sufficient, the air conditioning system will in, uh, increase the cooling system. So this is for them, this is exciting. And you can see the plants growing. So this kind of uh, education should be put into our young generation so that they will love uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, in that way, their learning is wholesome. They know the technology, they know uh, the, when, when is the time that the, the, the plant ready for harvest, when is the time that the plant ready to flower, when is the time that the plant ready 
na for germination, you have to know that because the characteristic of the plant uh, in terms of the sunlight varies depends on the, their age. So they have to adjust the plant. The lights that this plant is receiving when they are still young is minimal. The lights that this plant is receiving when it is flowering is different and so on. So these things could supposed to be before are known only for agriculturists. But these kids now are electronics engineering. These kids now are manufacturing engineering. And they have learned this one. So that's the, the challenge as educator. How are we going to inspire our students uh, to make them more productive? Thank you very much, sir, the forum. We see progress right now. And we would like to request that you get for if you have still time to cover it. Okay, yeah, I'm going to answer this question about industry 4.0 and then how many did? Yeah, that's the answer. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I think in terms of reading this in Mindanao specifically, I think for me it's not yet ready. Why? <coughs> the first requirement of industry 4.0 is you have an internet. The machine communicate to other machine through internet. That's one definition of industry 4.0. What's what, what is internet connection now in Minina? Do we have an internet connection in the park like in the park? That's one question. Second, do we have a technopreneur? Do we have an innovators? Because we said innovators or the technopreneurs uh, will uh, drive this uh, industry 4.0. Our university tried to produce technopreneurs, but the problem is there is no, no yet, not no mindset. Or the, our students, their mindset is still in the traditional. They want to to earn a degree. They don't want that path to become entrepreneur. We have an experience that we introduce this technopreneurship. We encourage students. We have you have your good idea, but their mindset is to take board exam. They want to be employed. That's another problem. So the ecosystem is not yet there. And the support is limited. For example, technology, you need to have a strong linkage with industry, with investor. Another problem is the peace and order in the now. The investor cannot come here. Investor, business, business will support our technology. We have a good idea, for example, in the university. We have this product for so in support of smart agriculture to monitor the fertility of land. But the students, are they willing to pursue that uh, idea and become an entrepreneur? Is there an investor who will come here? So I think that would be the input to the policy maker. Let the Marshall, because one of the reasons why the investor cannot come here because of that Marshall. That's the Thank you very much, sir. We will entertain one more question and we will wind up this press conference. We would like to request Mark Francisco from Mindanao Daily. Uh, good afternoon, panelists. Uh, question for Director Tan. Um, taking off from the remarks of Dr. Cultura and the other statements earlier, uh, may we know if you have, if, uh, this early you can foresee in the next five years, the uh, um, applications for uh, industry uh, 4.0 uh, at a mass level here in Mindanao, in, and in which areas do you think uh, that this would be uh, practical and uh, applicable as far as the whole Mindanao is concerned? Thank you. Thank you. Young innovation will require three Cs. Number one would be a champion. So it, it may be the ideas, it may be anyone from the government agencies or business group. The second thing would be the change management process, not here. And number two would be the culture. At present, we have a culture of innovation, which uh, Dr. Kirino has shared. No? In terms of your question whether in the span of five years, we will be able to see any fire na 
But in, 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 in fire, we will start with a smoke, meaning the, the possible chance to do this will be USDP because it has the resources, it has the champion, it, ha it has developed technologies like the one uh, shared by Engineer Pasqua. So we are optimistic that uh, Mindana will be able to see fire in the, in the next five years. And on the part of Minda, we are including as one major theme an innovation. So from just peace, human development, social cohesion, governance, economy and environment, there's going to be a seventh theme, which is innovation. And we are currently updating the Minden of 2030. It's an updated plan from 2010 to 2030, but we will update it into 2018 to 2022. Oh, sorry, to 2030, where innovation is included. So hopefully, sir, we will be able to see that in the next five years with the help of our USDP, PITS, and, and, uh, and CRP, and the other higher education institutions, and other uh, agencies involved in the scientific uh, area. Thank you very much, sir. With that, we would like to close this press conference. We would like to hear a parting words from first from Dr. Um, Dr. Reyes, and uh, followed by Dr. Karina. I'd just like to highlight that, uh, well, just to say that um, I think these are exciting times because we can expect to see a lot of innovations, a lot of uh, technological improvements. And um, and although there are reports saying that there will be some, some displacement and we would expect that, but I think there will also be new jobs created that we haven't thought of before. In that we didn't think that there were programs like that. Um, so I, I think the challenge really now is for, and I pose this challenge for our partners, educational institutions, now, how do would they respond quickly to jobs that have not been identified as of now? And so um, I, I think you know, I think um, it's going to be very exciting because uh, we're in the midst of these disruptive technologies. There will be benefits definitely. Um, and, and I think what we just have to do is to be able to harness all of the opportunities that the fourth industrial revolution bring, um, is going to give us. And as a final note, um, again, I'd just like to mention that the PIDS will be holding its annual public policy conference on September 19, um, which is um, a bigger discussion of, of these issues um, where we're inviting um, more speakers to shed light on the different issues. And um, of course, if you're here, you can still watch us. Um, because we will be streaming the, the event via Facebook. Um, and so we hope that uh, um, we will be able to provide more information on this particular topic. Thank you. Sir? Yeah. So again, uh, the University of Science and Technology is very ambitious. Very ambitious indeed. And this is the purpose why we amalgamate. This is why uh, the former Moscow and the BBC has merged so to, uh, to showcase or to uh, demonstrate new things and it is exemplified in our curricular programs. We focus on science, technology, engineering, agriculture and mathematics. Those programs we uh, we usually offer are being trimmed down and that this gives way to utilize our manpower resources to new things so we offer new curricular programs which respond to the need of the times and we are not limited to uh, the traditional courses but rather we are free to craft new programs as society as industry would need. So we have mastered the development of a curriculum whereby we engage the stakeholders, the industries, uh, government agencies, and all our stakeholders, including parents, so that we will be convinced that we should 
let their sons and daughters enroll in these new courses. Otherwise, they would have no jobs if they finish a course of their choice that is very convenient. So, we encourage everyone to be disturbed because we live in a very disturbed environment. We have that mindset to respond appropriately. Otherwise, we will be replaced by machines and that we will be replaced by robots or other, other uh, jobs will be replaced by robots. And if we will not respond, we become jobless. So the University of Science and Technology is responding to all these calls. It is a dynamic university. It is a non-traditional university. The mindset and outlooks of this university is towards change. No, towards change. We cannot live in status quo, as I said this morning, but we have to challenge status quo. We have to develop new things, and that is the essence of innovation. Not only in how we do things, but on how we think about things. That's very important, so that we, we can respond appropriately. It should start from the mind, and then to our heart. For me, the real heart is still in the head. It is in the hypothalamus. Our heart here is only a biological heart that is being controlled by our psychological heart, the hypothalamus. So it is how we value things. It's how we uh, appreciate new knowledge, not that we live under the convenience of the present, but rather be distorted really for what will happen in the future. So uh, again, as a matter of promotion with our uh, local media here, we would like to uh, inform you that this Fort Mindanao Policy Forum focus on innovation is only a precursor to a bigger event, a national one, this coming October, that the university will solely sponsor the National Research Innovation and Investment Forum here in the city of Cape and New York. We will be waiting for your uh, feedback, sir. Yeah, so uh, Vice Chancellor Woods Kultaro is the focal person, and uh, blame him if you will not be invited. <laughs> Thank you very much. With that, uh, we would like to close our press conference at the 4th Indian Policy Business Forum. Thank you very much, members of the